A little boy was sitting on a park bench in obvious pain. A man, walk, a man walking by asked him what was wrong. The young boy said, I'm sitting on a bumblebee. The man urgently asked him, uh, why did you get up? The boy replied, well, uh, I fear I'm, hurt, I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. How many of us handle forgiveness like this little boy? We endure pain just for the satisfaction of believing we're hurting our offender more than he's hurting us. When will we get off the bench of unforgiveness? When will we begin to realize that there is freedom from that pain? Unforgiveness. Have you ever heard of that? I think there's a documentary right in the Discovery Channel, an exotic topic right there, unforgiveness. Let me ask you this. What's your bumblebee? What's your bumblebee? What's that thing that you're sitting on and you're holding a grudge, grudge, uh, grudge about and you're not releasing and it's causing you so much pain? Maybe this is something that you did and has destroyed relationships. Maybe this is an offense that has just bored deep down in your heart and just has sat there for a long, long time and it's this deep root of bitterness that doesn't allow you to be free. Maybe something you did a long time ago, maybe recently, but you're not letting it go. Maybe this is something that someone did against you. Something that really, really, really hurt you. And just letting it go without experiencing justice in a full way is just too hard. What's your bumblebee? We've been talking for a, for a few weeks now, for a couple of weeks now, on, on our sermon series, The Bad News and the Good News. And this sermon series is basically camping on the question, uh, how does God want us to deal with sin, the destructive effects of sin, with the life-giving and life-transforming power of the gospel? So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about sin, the sin of the world. The world is trapped in so many dark situations and practices. It's just this slippery slope. It's a descending spiral of destruction and sin. And we talked about how the gospel is God's solution to bring reconciliation to bring justification. Our, the posture of the church for the world is one of witness. First question we want to ask when we're talking about sin is this. Is this situation something that affects a believer or a non-believer? Is this for a follower of Jesus or somebody that doesn't follow Jesus? Somebody without Jesus is as good as dead. Ephesians 2.1 tells us we were dead in our sins and trespasses. It's not that we're sick is that we're dead. Without Jesus Christ, we're, we're as good as dead. So we need to receive the gift of life. We need to be forgiven of our sins. We need to experience the new birth and have a new beginning. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Katie was just sharing with us a little bit of the blessing. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The new has come. The old is gone. When Christ comes to live in our life, when the Holy Spirit takes over our body and, and indwells us, becoming the temple of the Holy Spirit, we receive forgiveness of sins. We receive a new birth. We receive a new identity. And our new identity is that we are in Christ. Christ is in us. He defines who we are. He defines our eternal destiny. We belong to him and we will be with him forever. When his kingdom come on the day, comes on the day of the resurrection, he will make everything new. So we deal with sin in terms of confession, in terms of repentance, restoring fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1 tells us God's already made provision to forgive our sins. Now, in the fellowship, we have very clear instructions. Our posture is church discipline. When there is public unrepentant sin, an act of love from the body of Christ to, a, to an unrepentant member is to confront that sin, first very personally, and then it moves, according to Matthew 18, in circles, until it becomes public. And if it is public and unrepentant, then the nuclear option, if you remember, is really no fellowship, no fellowship with that rebellious member. Hopefully that person will come back. Hopefully that will bring repentance. But God's discipline is bigger than church discipline. It is an act of love. Hebrews tells us that God disciplines those whom he loves, like a loving father. Discipline is an act of love so that we may not remain in sin and experience the consequences of sin. 
So witness, discipline. But what happens when actually there's repentance? What happens when the person that is in sin is lovingly confronted and there is repentance? Is there a process for restoration? Is there a process to get that bumblebee, get up and, and, and up, put a limit to the pain and the destruction and rebuild? Is there a process for that? Well, thankfully, yes, there is. So today, today we have the last message of our sermon series, by the way. We plan our sermon series quite in advance. This one has been a little bit of a different one. Uh, this one, um, I don't like planning my ser sermons week to week, but this particular series has been a discerning exercise for our leadership, our ministerial staff, on where God is leading our church. Guys, I am convinced, as I told you at the beginning of the year, that God has set our church for fruitfulness. But one of the questions I asked you was, what would we do if God were to bless us with 100 new believers that we had to disciple? What would we do? This is what I realized. Our lives, when we come to Christ, we are very broken. And it is not enough just to be theologically prepared. It is not enough to be financially prepared to minister to people. We need to be emotionally healthy. We need to be emotionally mature. We need to be relationally healthy to be able to raise new life. When you are in a position where you yourself are hurting, where the enemy has taken advantage of you, and you haven't experienced the healing of Christ, then we're limping and we are not our best. So before we can become more fruitful, before we can take care of more people, I believe God is going to be lifting up the proverbial carpet, the rug, and look at everything that we've been sweeping under. There is plenty under that rug. You can no longer walk on top of it. It is so bumpy and bulgy everywhere. We just walk around it. We no longer acknowledge it. We don't talk about you-know-who, right? We don't talk about you-know-what. It is too painful. We have lived coping only, not thriving. So before we can be more fruitful, I believe the Lord wants to look into our lives and he wants to set us free. He's not here to shame us. He's not here to guilt us. You know why? Because if he wanted to, he would bring judgment. And this is a season of grace. This is a season of mercy where God is inviting everybody into the kingdom for free. Because of what the Son has done, He already died on the cross. He was buried. He rose on the third day. He's provided everything for justification to address guilt and reconciliation to address, address shame. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more. But we got to get healthy. We got to be able to, to acknowledge the sins that we've done against other people. And we have to be able also to acknowledge the sins committed against us. There is plenty of grieving that we're going to have to do. There is plenty of trauma healing that is going to have to take place. There is plenty of healing because there's plenty of pain. So the question we're going to be dealing with today is precisely, oh, not that one, not even the bumblebee, is this one. What does restoration from sin look like in the body of Christ when there is repentance? When we acknowledge the consequences and the destructive power of sin, how does reconciliation, how does restoration, how does this process of renewal look? In the body of Christ. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to open it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 to 11. We're going to look at some things that are rough. But let me tell you this. You no longer have to sit on that bumblebee. You got to stand up. It is an illusion. If you think that just relishing pain and nursing this grudge is going to bring you any satisfaction, it will be probably a temporary bittersweet feeling that you're in control, but it is a destructive one. It's going to corrupt your character, and also it's going to isolate you from God, from, from other people. It's going, to, it's going to trap you in a very dark prison of unforgiveness. So we're going to look at some things that are difficult, and this may require for you to get some extra help. Let me, let me point you in the right direction. Right here in, the, in our care center, we have this little booklet called The Forgiveness of God. Just today, because it's our special for... No, I'm just kidding. It's included with your ticket today. If you want one of those, those are free in there. Feel free to grab one. If we run out, we'll print more for next week. But it's called the forgiveness of God. One of the greatest gifts of salvation is to know that we are forgiven, that we're given a new beginning, that God doesn't look at us in our imperfections or our mistakes or our sins. God looks at us through his son, Jesus Christ, with pleasure, with joy, with blessing. 
So this little booklet is going to point you in the right direction. If you need somebody at the end of the service today to pray for you, every single Sunday we say, we have people to pray for you here. We also have people in our, in our care center. If you want to, on my left hand, we have these booklets, and we have many other ones. They're all free. Grab as many as you want. So the forgiveness of God. If you need help because of your past or because of what you have, have experienced that is such that needs professional counseling, come talk to one of our ministers, and we would be happy to point you in the, in the right direction with some professional counselors that we work, we would love to support you as a church to have to be on a pathway to healing. So with that, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In order for restoration from repentance, from repentance sin to be possible, there are three things that Paul tells us in this passage we must be able to develop and to do to be able to experience the blessing of restoration. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. Listen to Paul, what he's saying as he writes his letter to the church in Corinth, he says, 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 11. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, if anyone has caused me pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have been forgiven, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So what's going on here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11? Well, if you remember from previous sermon last week, if you haven't had a chance uh, to listen to that one, you didn't come last week, no worries, it's right there online. You can access it on our website if you want to see a little bit more of the context of what's going on here. But if you remember from last week, Paul had a very lively relationship with the church in Corinth. The Corinthians were people who had come to Christ, who had experienced the blessing of the new birth. They were in Christ. They were a new creation. The old was passing away. The new was already there. But they were still struggling with a lot of things. They were divisive. They were uh, just grumbling all the time. They were sexually immoral in many ways. Scholars have tried to explain what is it exactly that Paul was addressing here, what was the conflict that he was addressing here, and there is not a, a one-voice consensus on exactly what was going on. But many scholars think that 2 Corinthians is actually a follow-up to 1 Corinthians. You're like, duh, you need a PhD for that? Oh, well, bear, bear with me. There may be more than just 1 or 2 Corinthians, right? There may be other letters. There may be other situations and other correspondence. Now, this is what God chose to give us so that we can grow and mature as inspired by the Holy Spirit as sacred scripture. But there may be many other ways in which Paul interacted with the church. What scholars are not exactly sure is that, is, is that 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11 is a follow-up to the specific situation that Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians 5. Remember that one from last week? There was a man living with his father's wife. So there was a situation of incest, and they were proud. And they were really, really uh, not doing anything about this, not even addressing it. People were living in open, unrepentant sin, and they were not doing anything. And Paul said, guys, you are proud. You're full of hot air. Shouldn't you lament? Shouldn't you confront these evildoers? Shouldn't you do something to guard the, holy, the holiness of the body of Christ and protect the reputation of the gospel? Shouldn't you do something? And Paul said, you need to do something. This is what you're going to do. You're going to assemble together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will be present in spirit, and you will turn this person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We want this person to be saved in the day of the Lord, his spirit, a church discipline is going to exclude him from the fellowship of the body, and he will have the consequences of his sins. And there was big turmoil. There was all sorts of conflict going on in 1 Corinthians. 
Some people think that what Paul is referring to as this painful letter may be 1 Corinthians. Other people think there may be another letter and other things in between. What we all agree about is this. There was plenty of pain and plenty of conflict. And 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talked about the caliber of this conflict. There were people that were not just sinning around, but there were people that were including Paul in their target. People were questioning if he was an apostle. He wasn't as eloquent as Apollos. He wasn't as powerful. They said his letters are pretty powerful, but his presence is contemptible. He's, I mean, he's this little kid. I mean, so there were people attacking Paul and attacking each other, and there was a lot of conflict. Bottom line, there was plenty of sin and pain. So the apostle confronts this evil with the word of God, speaks the truth in love. Ironic, isn't it, that such a beautiful passage as 1 Corinthians 13 is God's revelation and healing and remedy for such painful situations as divisions, as grumbling, as slandering. So where we, we, where we hurt the most, God wants to show her his love the most. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells them, we have struggled so hard, but thank God. There's been repentance. There's been a turnaround. People that were persistent in sin realize the destructive power of sin, and they repented, and they've turned around. Now, how do we take back those who have hurt us deeply? How do we build, rebuild relationships? This happened to all, happens to all of us, doesn't it? And not just individually, but also collectively. Let me ask you this. Do churches split? No, right? It's theoretical. How about Baptist churches? You know, some people think that Baptist churches plant churches by division, splitting. No, no. You shouldn't be planting churches by conflict. God sometimes redeem our redeems our mistakes. But the Bible tells us to be quick to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity the Spirit makes. We cannot make this unity. This is a supernatural result of the gospel in us. We come together because of Jesus Christ. But when there is fighting, when there is quarreling, when there is divisiveness, when there is sin, public unrepentant sin, there will be a lot of pain. How do we come back from that? There are three things that Paul tells us that we need to do. The first one is this. First, we must acknowledge the reality of sin's destructiveness and allow ourselves some permission to grieve. In other words, we need to see this process of restoration and rebuilding as a process from lament to joy. Look at what Paul says right there, verse 1 again. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. When there is conflict, it's so easy to just... Sweep it under the rug, isn't it? What's wrong? Nothing. That's all good. And you don't talk to me the way you used to. I'm okay. I don't know. What's going on? Mm -mm. And that thing keeps growing and growing and growing. And our relationships change. And then we start perceiving people in a different way. And then we play all, all sorts of mind games, right? This person is doing that because, ah, yeah, well, of course. And it's all in our mind. You know what Paul says right here? Instead of dwelling on those kind of things, how about we get real? How about we get real and we acknowledge that we will hurt each other and that we do actually sin? And when that happens, let's have a face-to-face -face encounter when I can tell you with tears if necessary that you have hurt me or that I have hurt you. When we can deal with conflict in a very personal, very productive way? What do you mean productive? Conflict is inevitable. But we have a choice. 
And the choice is to deal with conflict in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. Paul tells us right here, first of all, he acknowledged, acknowledges that, they, yeah, you cause me pain. There is when, when sin happens, there, there are several dimensions as, as of sin. I want you to think of sin as a multifaceted stone with different angles and different glimmers and different things. First, there is an active and there is a passive dimension of sin. What is the active dimension of sin? When you're guilty. When you hurt somebody, when you do something that is destructive towards somebody else, you are sinning. Oh, I didn't even realize that what I said hurt you, but it did. Maybe you have developed a habit of being short with your words. Maybe your tongue is really, really sharp, and you don't even realize who you hurt. Now, sometimes people are hypersensitive. Okay, we get it. We have, we have a lot of people around us, right? But maybe you have done something that has hurt somebody else. Guess what? Sin makes us guilty, whether we realize it or not. We just read Leviticus, right, in our Bible reading plan in the Remain Journal. I love how God makes provision to atone for sin, but make no mistake, this is not for willful sin. This is not for things that, that the, the old people, the oldest and people, the people of Israel will do just willingly. This is for sin, but not intentional sin. This is more like the sin that is inevitable in our journey. God make provision for that, but make no mistake, even when you don't realize in the Old Testament, you're still guilty of sin. And when you find out, you have to offer the sacrifices. In the New Testament, I told you last week, the solution for our sin is confession because Jesus is already our propitiation. First John chapter 2 says that he is the propitiation for our sins, not just our sins, but the whole world. God's already paid the price in Jesus Christ, but you and I, to be reconciled into fellowship, you and I still have to confess our sins. If we don't confess our sins, John calls that walking in darkness. When you offend somebody, when you sin against somebody, you're not in fellowship with God. And every week, guys, every week we have a chance to come to the Lord's Supper. Every week we have a chance to have a come to Jesus meeting, literally, at his table. Where to be able to partake of this bread and this cup, we have to be in communion, in fellowship with God and with each other, with the body of Christ. If you eat this bread and you drink this cup and you're guilty and you disregard the body of Christ, which is your personal relationship with God, but also your horizontal relationship with the body of Christ, you know what that brings to you? According to 1 Corinthians 11, that brings judgment over you. And Paul says that's why some of you are weak and some of you have fallen asleep. Part of God's discipline. You can fool me, you can fool the whole congregation, but you cannot fool God. So when you and I actively sin against somebody else, there's one who knows and one who judges that. He sees. Now passively, what happens when somebody sins against us? When somebody causes pain? What happens when this becomes a secret? where the, the wound is really, really deep and nobody knows. What happens when it festers there? Well, God wants to address it. God wants to heal us. God wants to release us from the sins done against us. Yes, I can be a victim. But sin still clings to me and distorts my mind and my perception, my personality, my future. It robs me, steals, kills, and destroys everything that God wants for me. And I sit here in pain and agony, dying alone. How do we deal with sin when sin is done against us? Well, before we go to the solution, I want you to realize this. Pain is something that you and I cannot ignore. When somebody has hurt us, the first thing we need to do is to deeply acknowledge it in the presence of God and the body. And what, what can keep you from that? Here, here it comes. The, the individual and collective dimensions of sins, corporate dimensions of sins. Individually, we can feel guilt. And guilt is something that we need to be aware of when we are guilty, right? If we sin, we need to know that. But here's the thing. Guilt is not a place where God wants you to dwell. Once you know there is guilt, you need to come to the Lord and you need, need to bring it to him. But first, you need to acknowledge the reality of that pain. Guilt. And shame, shame is when you feel 
But there is no way anyone can love you for what you have done. You are repulsive. Your relationships are tarnished. And you cannot create any significant bond because you're so, you feel so bad about yourself. You know, many of us don't come to Christ because we feel guilty or we feel ashamed. No, 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 I have to clean my act first before I can come to church. That's a lie. You and I will never be able to clean our act enough for God to welcome us based on our merits. Never. Our good is not good enough. God welcomes us when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. When we were God's enemies, God welcomes us, not because of our merits, but because of his son's merits and because of his grace. Grace is unmerited favor for the sinner. God gives us his grace and welcomes us and deals with our sin in a way that only God can do. Sin is above our pay grade. Only God can pay for it. But the God who has paid for sin through his son, Jesus Christ, lavishly gives us his grace to address both guilt and shame. The answer to guilt is justification. By his son, God declares righteous those who believe in him because of what Jesus did on the cross. So you and I are no longer guilty if we are in Christ. God's righteousness has been satisfied by the son. So God sees you as righteous. He credits Christ's righteousness to you by grace through faith. Justified by faith, we have peace toward God, Romans says. So peace Justification is the answer to guilt. And what about shame? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old, the old is gone, the new has come. And Paul, if you keep reading, it says, And all this comes from God, who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is that God was making peace between the world and him by the peace of the cross. So we beg you, in the name of Christ, be reconciled with God. You know, there's plenty that people could pick from our stories that if it, if it was exposed, we could be very ashamed of. But guess what? God already knows everything. And even then invites us and says, I want to have a relationship with you. I love you. I love you. I want you to be part of my family. No more shame. I don't know what they call you out there. I, 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 I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm going to call you by your name. And then I'm going to call you by the name of my son and my family. I want you in. But first, you and I have to acknowledge the reality of pain. And that's what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying, listen, we can continue to dwell in this bitterness or we can grieve it the right way. Let's acknowledge what wrong is wrong. Let's cry over it. Let's come together and mourn together the destructiveness of sin. And you know what's going to happen? That's going to create a new bond, knowing that we are both broken. That's going to create the context in which God now can pour his mercy. Because when we have hurt somebody or somebody has hurt against us, we cry for, we cry for justice. Don't we want justice? Of course we want justice. And we should want justice. But the only one can, that can exercise perfect justice is God. You and I cannot be sitting on the judge's seat. That one belongs only to Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself says, the Father doesn't judge anyone. All judgment is given to the Son. One day, everyone will come before Jesus Christ. And on that final day, all justice will be served. But preliminarily, Jesus has already served justice by providing redemption and atonement at the cross. So we're in a process where God doesn't want the sinner to perish, but for everyone to proceed to repentance. God is merciful. He's giving us grace so that we can deal with the destructive power of sin, and he can rescue us from it. So, but first, we got to acknowledge the reality of pain and grief. And we have to learn to see each other as people who hurt. Let me ask you this in our worship. Do we have room for lament? We live, in a, we live in, a, in a culture where everything has to be exciting. We always want to be happy, right? Because you only live once, right? Live out loud, yeah! In your Bible, you have seasons of great joy and you have seasons of deep sorrow. You have a whole book dedicated to the agony 
and destructiveness of sin. Lamentations, right? Sometimes you and I need to pause and need to acknowledge something terrible has taken place. That is the cross. We have to mourn. We have to grieve. You know why? Because God does that with us. He gave us the Son to die on the cross. So I don't know where you're hurting, but we're all hurting. And God sees that. First, acknowledge the pain. Secondly, we must overcome our personal and corporate pain with the gift of forgiveness. Look at what Paul says right there in verse 6 to 9. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. You hear that? Is enough. There's been discipline. We've acknowledged the pain and the sorrow. Now let's rebuild, it says. It's enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. The process of restoration is a process where God seeks to reaffirm his love in our lives. And I, I, I don't want you to miss what Paul said. Yes, when discipline is served, when sin has been dealt already and there's repentance, there's contrition, there's an acknowledgement that this is evil, but we want to turn to what is right and good and we seek forgiveness and restoration, then what? Listen, I've never thought about uh, forgiveness this way. I always think about forgiveness as releasing, as being free. When you forgive somebody, you let go of yourself being the judge, bringing justice to that situation. You entrust that to God because you need to be free. When you're the offender, you need to be forgiven. You need to be free from your actions in the past, whatever that action was. You need a new beginning. But when somebody sins against you, you also need to be free from those decisions that somebody else imposed on you. You need to be free to, to put some distance so you can heal and you can have a new life on your own. Freedom. But I've never seen forgiveness this way. If you notice, Paul is saying, this is enough. He says, reaffirm love. Forgiveness, yes, it releases you to be free, but forgiveness is also God's gracious boundary, limiting the effects of sin so that he can reaffirm his love in our lives. In other words, when sin is acknowledged, is confessed, and is repented, you know what God does? Forgiveness creates a barrier so that sin can no longer reach to what God wants to do in love in your life. He says, you will no longer come this way. Remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Job, when God is talking, talking about creating the world and everything, when he talks about the ocean, this unruly, powerful force of nature, the ancients sometimes saw that as a god or demigod, yam, the power of chaos, trying to undo creation. In the book of Job, God says, I placed a boundary to the sea, and I said to its, its prideful waves, you will not pass from here. That picture of limits is exactly what forgiveness does. Forgiveness allows you to enter into a new chapter of your life where God's love will be reaffirmed in your life. There are some things that we hold on to God's love, but when we hurt and when we suffer, and when we're confronting with forgiving sin or being forgiven for the first time, we really get it closer to the way God does. Because when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If there's someone who knows what it is to forgive, that someone is God. And when we enter into his forgiveness, either forgiving or being forgiven, we experience a firm love that is the love of God. But you and I, need to be able to give God the freedom in our lives to move that way. So what is the gift of forgiveness? The gift of forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not an emotion. You may be thinking, well, I don't feel like I need to forgive. You don't need to feel anything. It is an act of obedience. Did you notice how Paul said? Right here he says, um, verse 9, for this for this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Forgiveness is not something that you do because you feel like doing it. Forgiveness is something that you do because you're obedient to God's word. What word? There are some notes right there in your handout if you want to read them later on, but I want you to take a look at them. In, 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 um, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 15, Matthew 18, verse 10 to 35. 
Jesus talks about how forgiveness releases us from the guilt and the shame of sin. But he says also, if you don't forgive somebody else their sins, my father is what? He's not going to forgive you. You know why? Because unforgiveness is sinful. Unforgiveness is sinful. Why? Because it chains you to sin and makes you the judge. And it's a little child of a prideful spirit. Unforgiveness gives you the illusion that you are God and shackles you to sin. But God wants you to be free from that. And God says, trust me. He invites you to have faith in him. Release it. Give it to me. Confess it. Release the person. Trust me with that pain. Trust me with that bitterness. And when we say no, guess what we make ourselves to be? Our own God. Certainly we know better, right? So Paul says, be obedient. What's the model of forgiveness? Let me read you a verse. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13 is a beautiful verse that tells us exactly how is it that God wants us to forgive each other. It says, Colossians 3, 12 through 13, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let me ask you this. How much has the Lord forgiven us? Just a little? So much. So we ought to forgive. Only those who have been forgiven by Christ are able to forgive like Christ. And Paul says this is what we should do as a church. The church should be a community where forgiveness is the currency of relationship. We should be a church of forgiveness, of opportunities to live the grace of God. Not of grudges, not of divisiveness, not of bitterness, not of pain. Freedom. Lastly, we must elevate the struggle from the sinful arena of Satan's schemes to the presence of Christ. Did you notice at the end? Paul says, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Very personal. Sin hurts us corporately and very personally. We need to forgive personally. And corporately. It says, if I have forgiven anything, it has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. When you realize that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces that seek to destroy us and divide us, and when you know that the enemy is trying to get in between, remember when Jesus prayed, prayed in, in John 17, I pray that they will be one. So as you and I, Father, are one, so the world may believe that you have sent me. When the church is riddled with division and bitterness and unforgiveness, do you think we can show the world the love of Christ? Jesus said, by this they will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Reaffirm your love. When we forgive in the presence of God, we take what we think is a very fleshly struggle right here in our interpersonal relationships, and we put it before the throne of Christ. We bring it to the Lord, who is the only one who can really handle this. And this is why we say, Lord, I am hurting. Somebody hurt me and did this and this to me. Lord, it's eating me up. I cannot carry this myself. Would you please take it? Would you please be the judge? I trust you to do justice and righteousness. I no longer seek revenge. Because we can be motivated no longer for justice sake, but for revenge sake. Lord, I no longer seek revenge. You deal with this. Set me free. Set me free from what that person did to me. Set me free. If you have sinned, you say, Lord, I did what is evil in your eyes. I did this and that. Please forgive me. I deserve, I deserve to suffer for it, but you're gracious. Please forgive me. I need you. I need you. Cleanse me. Help me start again. Renew in me a righteous spirit. My heart is broken for you. Lord, I want the fellowship of your spirit with me. You repent. 
And then you receive his forgiveness. And then you extend forgiveness. James chapter 5, 16 says, When someone is sick, call the elders of the church to pray over him. They'll pour oil on his head. They'll pray for him. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, right? If you had committed sins, they'll be forgiven. But then he says, Confess your sins to each other so that you may be healed. There's a connection between your spirit, your mind, and also your body. You know that unforgiveness is one of the main causes for bodily dysfunctions? All that stress you carry, all those chemicals flowing in you that are so negative and poisonous, they are literally killing you physically. Forgiveness is good for the spirit and it's good for the body. It's good for everything in you. Forgiveness is God's medicine for the bitterness of relational sin and conflict. And it's there for you if you want it. But it is an act of faith. It's an act of faith to come and trust the Lord. So let me close with this. Forgiveness is God's boundary where the destructive power of sin ends and the freedom of Christ's love begins. There is no healing from sin without forgiveness. There is none. Sin begins to heal when God begins the process of forgiveness. I read a couple of weeks ago about an incident where Cory ten Boom, a survivor from the Nazi camps in Germany, Cory ten Boom and her sister, her family, they were believers. And they were keeping Jewish people in their house to protect them from the horrors of the Nazis and all that. And they got caught. So they were sent to a, they were sent to a concentration camp. And one time, Cory ten Boom was preaching in a church about sharing about, about forgiveness and what God had done in her soul. And right there in the audience, there's an elderly gentleman that comes to her. And as soon as she sees him, she recognizes him. This man was one of the cruelest people she had ever met, one of the guards in the concentration camp. And he comes and says, that was a very fine talk. Thank you for sharing that. Forgiveness is a beautiful gift. And he reached out his hand to her. Her whole family perished under the horrors of Nazi Germany. She barely made it alive. And she saw all those indignities against, against the image of God, her very family. She had been sharing about God's forgiveness. No problem as a concept. But in that moment, forgiveness became very personal, very painful. Listen to what she said. It says, the guard said, I was a guard there. I'm ashamed to admit it, but it is true. But since then, I've come to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It has been hard for me to forgive myself for all the cruel things that I did, but I know that God has forgiven me. Please, if you would, I would like to hear from your lips, too, that God has forgiven me. Corey res- recorded her response in her book, saying, I stood there. I, who since had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive, I could not have been, it could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. It was as simple, as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raised down my arm, and sprang into our joint hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all of my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Reaffirm your love. That's what this table is for. Close your eyes right there in your place. We're going to come to the table. And here at the table, we will meet Christ. If there is some sin that you haven't confessed, this is your chance to confess it. If there is some bitterness, if there is something that's keeping you from the freedom of Jesus Christ, this is the time for you to ask for forgiveness. 
And if somebody has hurt you, if somebody has sinned against you, maybe this is the day where God wants you to extend forgiveness. Maybe that person is not repentant, but you can still forgive. Maybe the person has repented. Maybe there will be restitution. You can forgive and trust it in God's hands. Close your eyes right there. And this is a time for you to pray as we come to the Lord. somebody to pray for you we're here for you if you need healing you want to confess your sin God is ready to forgive God is ready to heal Father God we come before this table today we come remembering the price your son paid for us. So as we partake of this bread and this cup, Lord, I pray that the blood that was spilled for our sins, Lord, the forgiveness of our sins, will cleanse us and wash us new again. Father God, we need your son, Jesus Christ. Without him, we are completely lost. We come to the table needing your grace. But if there is anyone here in the clutches of sin, I pray, Lord, that you will bring forgiveness today. Release us, Lord, from all bitterness, from spirit of revenge, from spirit of conflict and hurting other people, Lord. Release us, Lord, to have a gracious heart, a contrite heart. Lord, test us and know our hearts. See if there is any grievous way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name.